Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will discuss URI's approach to peacemaking with Reverend Victor Kazajian, Executive Director of URI, Maria Crespo, Director of Cooperation Circle Support in Argentina, and Isabel uh, Ortega, uh, Director of Global Communication Strategic Planning. And thank you for joining us, panel. And a reminder to Zoom attendees, we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted to the Q&A functions at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. I am so happy that, that we're here to talk about peacemaking. In today's world, no topic is more important given the divisions that seem to be given uh, licensed by uh, some of our leaders around the globe. So let's talk a little bit about URI, your founding, the impetus for your work. And, and then let's talk about how you actually organize, because that, that is such a fascinating story. Victor, do you want to uh, jump in and just, just talk about how the organization was founded and, and where it is today? Great. Thank you so much, Mark. It's great to be with you on the show and with Isabel and Maria. URI's birth emerged out of the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. And it was at that point when the United Nations asked Bill Swing, who was then the Bishop of California, to gather interfaith leaders from around, around the world together as part of that celebration. The notion originally was that religions needed to come together in order to bring peace into the world and that countries were coming together at the UN, but religions needed to come together too. But as that grew, as the movement began to be explored, it was clear that the inst institutional religions were actually not interested in doing that. And so URI took a turn. And the turn is a turn that I think is so relevant today as our institutions continue to fail us in bringing peace in our world, which is to turn to people, ordinary people in communities who want to see their communities thrive. And so the notion became that you could bring together ordinary people of all beliefs around community-based humanitarian projects in their, in their communities and work together to deepen their understanding of each other and to create peace, justice, and healing in their communities. So 20 years later, we are in 108 countries, over a thousand what we call cooperation circles, circles of people of all beliefs who work together for the good of their community and the world. And the thing that I think is so interesting about what you've done and the whole history, uh, the arc of your history, is this idea of religion not with a capital R, right? This isn't about the institutional identities of organizations that are either trying to achieve greater adherence or are, are in philosophical conflict with people who have a different view and a different set of rituals. This is small r religion. It's the whole idea of values that imbue different faiths. So regardless as to what one calls one's God or gods, it's really about how do we live on a day-to-day -day basis in a small r way. Maria, when you look at your own involvement and how you got involved uh, from uh, Argentina, could you talk about your own personal uh, motivation for getting involved in this particular situation? And Argentina has a very, very long history, as I guess every nation does, of of conflict that is also based in religion. Yeah, thank you, Mark, uh, for the invitation to this webinar and also for the question. I love to respond to that. Um, the reality is that um, I'm based in Argentina. I come from a Roman Catholic family, was uh, brought up in a Roman Catholic school for my Roman Catholic um, family, but uh, I had and this is the reality of many Argentinians, right? Um, so um, it is the majority. But, and very much committed in my church, and I continue to be that. But um, the reality in Argentina is that there are minorities, other groups, uh, Christians, and other religions that have been kind of left out of everything, even politics. Um, and so in 1997, URI had one of its first um, assemblies outside the U.S. And it was in Buenos Aires. It was brought by Father Louis Dolan. And um, it was in UN 
building that um, 70 people gathered and to discuss how could we build cooperation among people of different faiths and indigenous traditions and those that are non-believers or with a different belief system. And we all sat together for, for a whole week in discussing how could we could cooperate and help each other. And the enthusiasm of that group of people that was for the first time um, engaged in, in this dialogue of building a better world for all was exciting. I, I was 40 at that time. I had five little children. Um, I was kind of so much enthusiastic about this new organization coming to our country, inviting us. So I, I love what you said about the um, capital letter R and the small R. And we are, I feel that we are capital letter. We are all leaders in our role, own religions and we have to show a path. And I think that it was the opportunity for me and others to show the path of collaboration, of working together, of impacting the society, the world that I wanted to see for my children and the children of my children. So from that meeting, I was invited to go. So this is May 1997, and I was invited to come to the 1997 assembly in Stanford University. And there I came on the flight with, with a good friend from the indigenous tradition, a Jewish woman, a pastor, um, some young um, university students. And there we went um, to the unknown and to see people of the world of different religions. And uh, there's so much that we learn uh, in working with others, in sharing with others, in praying and thinking with others that um, I couldn't leave uh, since then. And I continue to be engaged more and more in this wonderful organization that uh, brings us as simple, ordinary people active in our churches or our communities to work together and how much we learn and how much we understand when we are working with other ages, other, um, uh, other people of other religions, uh, my discovery about indigenous traditions in a country where indigenous tradition is so important. And my friendship with indigenous people through URI has been life-changing. And, and you're making a very good point. Um, part of this is really about talking to people that you've never known, mm. right? It's, it, and, and, and that brings with, it, with its own challenges here because of the limits of Zoom, we're all speaking English. Mm -hmm. But Isabel, when you're binding people together as, as uh, a person who is dealing with communications and strategic planning, um, language doesn't really define uh, impact, nor does it define the communications that need to actually take place. We need to cross language ba barriers as well as religious barriers and barriers of, of belief. How do you deal with, with those issues that are very difficult? To, you know, people don't have common languages. How do you deal with that in, in your work? Thank you, Mark. It's such an honor to be here with you. Um, we deal with it in the same way that we approach the organizational design of URI from the bottom up. So URI is not a typical hierarchical Western nonprofit organization that sort of creates programs and then filters it out through its member groups. It's sort of flipped in over its head. We rely on the member groups on the ground doing grassroots works to feed and nourish the entire network with ideas and solutions that can bring about peace in many different contexts. And so when we look at communications, we approach it in a similar way. We look to the professional communicators on the ground who are doing the work. And then we try to translate the work that they're doing and then interpret that through, um, through a professional lens. And so when I look at the responsibility that we have as a network to share these stories of amazing work that ordinary people are doing on the ground to uplift um, their situation to tackle humanitarian um, issues that are relevant to their community, we stay in constant communication with them. We, we look to folks like Maria who are in touch with other communities apart from her own 
to help facilitate that discussion and to make sure that we're trying to get it right. We've been at this for two decades and it's a, it's a continuous learning experience. And it's, it's not just a matter of figuring out what right words to use, what stories to tell, but it's also what kind of communication platforms we need to be looking at to make sure that the stories are getting out there to the people who need to hear them and that we're reaching the people who need to have their stories told. What I find to be so interesting is that in the aftermath of the founding of the United Nations, which occurred uh, in reference to the, uh, to the failure of the League of Nations, right. Right, we, were, we were talking about world conflict. It was basically a question of how do you avoid this type of conflict going into the future? And now we have atomized conflicts all over the world, um, very often uh, facilitated by uh, lack of conversation, lack of communication. Uh, we just completed a poll in which 80% of respondents believe that or asserted that uh, the biggest driver of conflict today is, are not religious disputes, which very often are placed as at the forefront, or territorial disputes, which also very often are placed at the forefront. It's really about who controls resources and levers of power. Right? How do we navigate this competition amongst individuals and groups where people are trying to control resources and control level, levers of power? How do we navigate that? And, and, and I guess the impetus here, Victor, is that you're trying to navigate it through discussion and through an understanding of law and conflict resolution that does not result in, in physical uh, subjugation. Right. right. That's, that's so true, Mark. And, you know, we see in the world today this sort of competitive world, the competitive world in all sectors of, of society where people see themselves pitted against each other with a, over scarce resources and kind of battling over those resources, whatever they are. That also infects our political systems and sort of even in democracies like our own where we see a competitive democracy, democracy used to kind of bring one group power over another power. URI is about cooperation. It's about cooperative democracy. It's about these circles and communities of people of different beliefs and perspectives, not just faith beliefs, but also political perspectives and perspectives, um, ex life experience, coming together in all of their diversity, engaging that diversity in an appreciative and cooperative way so that we're modeling a different way of binding a community together, a different sort of social cohesion that is so desperately needed as so often in our world, particularly in the political world, the sort of divide and rule or divide and conquer philosophy has pitted people against each other around different identity factors, one of the worst of which has been religion and how religious ins institutions have perpetrated that by perpetuating the notion that there's only one truth and they have it. Um, so we are about bringing people together around a common set of values and URI has this charter which was created by the people of the world, by hundreds of people who came together around a common set of values that said we'll respect each other, that said we can unite around cooperative action in our communities. And so it's all about that sort of cooperative, appreciative approach to life on this planet, both among human beings and also with the planet itself. Is there also a, a need to look at tactics of, of, of individuals who are not interested in this? I'm powerful. I know what I want. Why should I listen to you? You're annoying me. You're just annoying me. I'm going to basically denigrate you. I'm going to marginalize you. I don't want to listen to you. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with that? Because, you know, we can all hold hands and say, you know, we want to listen. But there are also power dynamics. I mean, basically this conversation, Maria, Isabel, I mean, this, this whole conversation is there because not everybody wants to listen. Right? The more powerful, I like to exercise power. And even in, in a guerrilla struggle, right, there are different ways that power can be exercised in ways that subvert 
current power structures. So there are all these clever ways to not listen to each other. How do we deal with that? Uh, so true, Mark. I think that there are some basic values that um, were there when the creation of URI that have continued and have deepened in our community that are so important to deal with this. Um, one aspect of said is appreciation. Um, in the birth of URI, we had um, the, a university helping us to, to run um, the organization with appreciative inquiry or appreciative interviews. And this has to do with, I can listen and can, I can be an active listener and appreciate what you bring. Even if it is a different perspective, a different political idea or um, a different faith um, system. So I think that is basic um, for URI, listening, appreciation, and being open to diversity. Uh, we, in Argentina, we used to go to schools a lot. And once when they received this wonderful group of people of different um, um, religions, spiritual expressions, and indigenous traditions brought by URI, the, the, the college students have put a big notice saying, um, God created, this was a Catholic school, and God created um, us different and we have become distant. So yes, we are different, we are unique, we are special, but why distant? Uh, we are so much enriched in diversity and in a good dialogue with people that think differently, believe different, uh, have a different context. So this is, has been very basic to you, all right? And I think it is basic for conflict resolution, is understanding that there might be different perspectives that not necessarily are opposing and we have to contradict and we have to compete. It's, we are horizontal. We are, as indigenous, help us build this circle of different people talking and exchanging understandings, beliefs, and points of view. Are you saying that gentle persistence is actually a tactic? <laughs> You are right. And, yes. common, and common cause, right? It's like, what, what, do we, what in our lives can we work on together for, for our communities? We may not agree on politics. We may not agree. We may actually have been at war with each other. You know, the Philippines, Isabel, is a good example of that. And, and that's quite a story of how have you or I people working with people who, who were from warring backgrounds. If I may expand on that, there is a, a wonderful organization that counts itself as one of our cooperation circles in Mindanao in the Philippines, which as some of your viewers might know is, is a very conflict laden area. Um, there are groups there led by Pakig Diet who have reached across the other in a way, but, but it's, it's, there are some members of the Muslim, the Christian communities, the indigenous communities there who have actually reached out to form a relationship with military leaders and representatives of a predominantly Christian background. And through that relationship that's formed, you're able to kind of shake up current power structures and the, the deep rooted friendships that begin to emerge as a result of that initial point of contact, that curiosity, that persistence, um, as you said, Mark, has, has worked very effectively in various contexts around the world. I'd also like to propose another tactic, which is this idea of assigning power to those who may feel like they're powerless. If there are these pre-established points of authority where they say, I have the power and I have the strongest opinions. What you or I has done over the last little while is to tell other people, local grassroots leaders to say, you can be as powerful too. And there is a lesson in self-empowerment, in owning their story, in owning their truth, in owning the solutions that they can bring about to the world and really strengthening that. We do that with a focus on women, we do that with a focus with young emerging leaders, with indigenous, as Maria referenced before. So it's also not just about giving validation to those voices of power who may be so entrenched in their beliefs that they don't want it shaken up and they think we're annoying and they don't want to listen to us, but it's finding other sources of power who can then rise up and offer a different perspective. It's interesting that, that you're making this point. We just completed another poll 
And, and what, what I find to be so interesting about these results is that nobody thought that you can stop conflict by outlawing violence, by just saying, we're not going to have any violence, right? We are human beings, right? If we feel strongly about something, we can sometimes explode in our emotion and you can't just stop it. Um, also, there was, there was, again, a very few people who felt that we can, we can stop conflict by prohibiting supply of arms to parties in conflict. But there was a huge consensus that communication was important. Mm -hmm. um, there was a 92% of people felt that communication was, was the tool. And then there was, uh, there was very much of an even split on uh, providing conflict resolution, use of uh, third party mediators, providing a voice at the table for women, which is your uh, point, Isabel. And, and uh, the, the, this whole idea of maybe we have to just think a little bit differently and be a little bit patient with difference, right? Yeah, you know, and Mark, there's, there's the point when conflict has already broken out which we seem to live in a lot these days. And then there's the point before that. And I think one of the things that URI is particularly committed to is creating the conditions that mitigate the need for conflict as a, as a response to difference of opinion, violent conflict especially, and create other pathways towards solving problems. And so if the problem solving phase before conflict breaks out, there's a whole set of things that particularly nonviolent sort of approaches like communication, like dialogue, like engagement in communi healthy community practices that lift up economic standing or you know, reduce the incidence of, of, of violence. Those pre kind of conditions that get people into a more healthy and thriving place that prevent conflict from happening in the first place. That's really important. So that could be education, that could be good health care, that could be economic empowerment. And so we do a lot of work in the preventative phase of conflict. And then we do work, as Isabel said, in the, when, the, when conflict is broken out or when there are extremist groups wreaking havoc in the north of Nigeria, you know, we also go in there. And then when, when we're present to give alternatives to violence to those who are in conflict, because conflict is normal. Conflict is a part of human, human beings, but violence in, as a response to conflict or as a way of being in conflict is what we're really talking about. Whether it's violence that happens in sort of physical ways or violence that happens in more structural ways. Maria, when, when we're talking about conflict, in many respects, we're either before conflict, during conflict, or after conflict, because we're human beings, right? There are always going to be disagreements. It's the same in our families, right? I mean, there will be, there will be conflicts and disagreements. Um, as you provide cooperation circle support, Victor was implying that people are talking about a lot of other things um, that are not directly related to conflicts, um, but feed into them. Issues of healthcare, issues of respect, uh, issues of, of e economics, how people are earning living. Uh, living. How do you, in your, in your role, providing support to these cooperation circles, uh, surface these issues? And in 108 countries, I mean, you know, all, all the different uh, uh, countries in the continent of Africa, all the different countries in Central and South America, uh, all the different countries in the Middle East, all the different religions. How do you uh, draw those issues out so that people can process them in a way that, that avoids uh, disastrous conflict? Thank you, Mark. And this is a very interesting question in URI because we think a little bit of that dual strategy. We get people together doing things for the good of all. And uh, this good of all can be we have 14 action areas that are very much that are very similar to the SDGs, um, um, and um, we so people together address conflict, but also um, indigenous issues or human um, rights or uh, poverty alleviation, and they respond to the need of the community. And a cooperation circle can. Um, 
can meet, can gather to address one of these things. Uh, the thing is we together. So the preamble of URI speaks, we as we together address this because our impact is, is bigger if we do this together. So if we are going to deal with environment issues, we are going to plant, we are going to alleviate poverty, we are going to do this together. So there are action areas. Um, it is not that we created the action areas and the CCs have to get into those action areas. So, but that the action areas were a way of categorizing what cooperation circles have chosen to address. Many of our members have created the cooperation circle to do the things together. Some of our cooperation circles are al already existing big organizations that were doing this work before they joined URI and thought it was a good idea to join URI so that they are inspired by other organizations, other groups around the world, that uh, we are providing a network that provides inspiration or training or capacity building. But um, at a local level, these organizations, these people are responding to a need that they have discovered. And what the, the particularity of this cooperation circles is that they are going to do this as a group. Our members have to be at least seven. Our cooperation circles have to have at least seven members or more from at least different, three different religions, spiritual expressions or indigenous traditions. So they have to address a purpose as a group in diversity. And whatever they choose is okay. We don't tell them what to choose. It, it would have been kind of strange that we, I am in Argentina and would tell people in Africa what to do. They choose what to do because this is their need and they do it together and they do it guided by the preamble purpose and principles of URI, which they uh, commit to follow as a group. As and an part of what you're saying is that by doing it in public, yes. right, now you, you start to have to think about the words that you say and how, they, how others are bearing witness to whether your words actually have meaning. Mm -hmm. your, your expressed religious values, are they actually imbued with reality? Um, I have, a, I have a, uh, uh, two other questions uh, for, uh, for you. One is, we're seeing a lot of refugee issues where people are suddenly coming into contact with people who have been dispossessed or, or moved from one place to another in a very rapid way. So we have this, these historical differences that you were referring to, Maria. But then we also have these dislocations that all of a sudden have people who are unfamiliar with each other suddenly um, in conflict. People in need, people fleeing, and people who would like to protect their homes. Um, are you involved, is the group involved in any of this type of work, uh, Victor? Yes, absolutely. And you know, the, one of the things that is common among all wisdom traditions is a form of the golden rule, right? That will treat others as we would, you know, want to be treated our, ourselves. And, and, and that golden rule philosophy that everyone is a neighbor, that everyone is um, a fellow human being on this planet who deserves respect, that's core to our, our work. So migration, immigration, the sort of refugee issues are, are very key to us. And also all of the issues that get triggered by that, including issues of racism and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia that we see in different parts of the world where the other is seen as someone to be feared. Well, in URI, the other is not only someone who we welcome into our home as, as, a, as a neighbor in need, but also is someone from whom we can learn. Someone different from our difference becomes an opportunity for curiosity and therefore to be in service to the other, to, to assist the other in need is a core value of all our cooperation circles, particularly in the issues of migration, but also now in COVID, because COVID has become another place where the world is driven into places of isolation 
and the, the responses to our community, as Isabel has been working on a lot, is to the COVID crisis, very much like the immigration crisis and all of the tangential issues that, that emerge in that. So we just completed another poll, and Isabel, I'd love you uh, to, to comment on it. Um, there seems to be a large co uh, consensus that uh, conflict is becoming worse due to the pandemic. Uh, we had um, a, a few people who, who believe the conflict is, is directly worse according, uh, due to the pandemic, and many more people felt that um, people who normally drive conflict are now leveraging the pandemic to drive even more conflict. Uh, very few people felt that, that uh, there was uh, either no change or that conflict was diminishing as people respond to the health crisis. What's your observation, Isabel? Well, I think that in some ways, the societal pressures exacerbate deep-seated anxieties and, and, and problematic perspectives. Because when you're driven into a high-stress mode, it triggers this personal response that sometimes is good, but more oftentimes in our, in our reality, to be quite honest, is, is not, is bad, downright bad. And so what we see are folks starting to huddle into their own echo chambers where maybe some problematic perspectives get reiterated. And one of the ways that we are working as a network is to try and provide stories to counter that perspective. Because what we're seeing within our network is an emergence of activity that answers Victor's point about doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, loving your neighbor. In some, uh, particularly in Africa and in Asia, we have hundreds of CCs responding to folks who are suffering from food shortages, who have no access to PPE, who have um, who are who are sick and can't access medical care, mm -hmm. and every day since March we've been receiving these amazing stories of people going to um, quote unquote slum neighborhoods to provide basic necessities um, to to prepare meals in in a very safe setting for distribution to gather groceries, to provide masks, hand washing stations in, in rural parts of the world. And it's just wonderful to see that kind of action emerging and to see where that response is coming from. One other thing that we're seeing in a more virtual context is people actually reaching out, looking for a place of connection and community in this time because we're driven into our homes, we're driven into our own spaces with no other avenues to really interact and maybe be exposed to other perspectives. They're using online platforms like social media as a cry for help. And so I think you or I in our history of providing safe spaces for dialogue and difficult discussion, we can also rise to the challenge of reaching out to these people who in some ways are suffering from from the feelings of isolation and the societal pressures to offer an alternate solution. And with that, um, I think that we can also bring that approach into our own lives. One is learn something about somebody who leads a different life and might have different beliefs and a different religion um, than, than ourselves, right? Inform ourselves, share our experience with someone else who doesn't know us, and have them share their experience with, uh, with, with us. Treat people like we would want to be treated. Yeah. Listen a little bit before we talk. All those activities that, are, that so imbue your work are things we can bring into our own uh, personal lives. I'd like to thank you all for your work, for, your, uh, for informing us, for teaching us perhaps how we can resolve uh, conflicts in our uh, small R ways. Uh, throughout our lives. That's the nonprofit report. Thank you all attendees for coming. Mm -hmm.